In this video I want to take a look at separation agreements in Irish law. This is going to be an overview of separation agreements. It's going to look at the essentials and it is an unfortunate reality that in Irish life nowadays relationships do break down, marriages break down and accordingly there is a need from time to time for a separation agreement. So let's take a look what's involved. Why would you use a separation agreement? There's a number of reasons. One, you can negotiate matters with the other party. So you might have the benefit of a mediator, you might have the maturity to do it yourself, or you may need the benefit of a solicitor who will negotiate on your behalf with the other party's solicitor. This is probably the best route to take because quite often emotions can run fairly high and sometimes it's better just to have a third party intervening as it were and negotiating on behalf of each party. Second reason why you might use a separation agreement is you want to stay out of court until it's absolutely necessary and in any event you're obviously going to have to wait for two years for a divorce if that's your intended route and Clearly, there's a need to regulate affairs in the meantime. Affairs of property, of perhaps maintenance, of custody, of access, if there's children involved, and so on. There could be quite a lot of other issues to be dealt with as well. But the bottom line is, you need some sort of a regulation or some sort of agreement between the parties where it breaks down before the relationship is finally terminated if it's terminated by divorce perhaps the separation agreement can lead to people coming back together again but certainly in the first instance it would be the norm that the relationship will en eventually end in a divorce and the parties will move on perhaps in new relationships a fourth reason why you might consider a separation agreement is that you and the other party you have more control over how things will be carried on between you and obviously that's something that you get an opportunity to feed into whereas if you go to court and there's a dispute about access or maintenance or custody then obviously you're going to have a decision imposed upon you by a judge who has to hear the conflict the conflicting arguments conflicting stories perhaps and then make a decision and it's a decision that may not uh, please either party so it gives you control over how things will be carried on between you and the other party parties can also use a mediator to help arrive at a fair agreement so there is a mediation service that you can avail of a free mediation service you could also go to a private mediator and he or she can help the parties to come together go through the issues and arrive at a fair agreement that fair agreement then could form basically a separation agreement which will then be signed off on as it were by the solicitors for both parties in other words each party would then get advised and they'll be advised as to whether this is a good deal bad deal fair deal or whatever and then sign off on it and it'll be signed and sealed as it were it'll be a private contract between the parties the types of thing that you would deal with in a separation agreement would include an agreement to live apart so one of the parties will move out of the family home if there is a family home and the parties will live apart there'll be a non-molestation clause that's essentially that each party will leave the other party alone issues of custody and guardianship will arise if there's minor children property obviously is a big factor if there's a family home and perhaps a mortgage maintenance is a factor as well it'll depend obviously on the parties and what way they are working and so on and clearly uh, the party generally the, the mum is retaining custody day-to-day -day care and control of the children in those circumstances uh, maintenance has to be provided obviously for the children and indeed for the mum uh, that's a legal obligation taxation needs to be agreed there's different methods of taxation different ways of being taxed and obviously that's something that could be agreed in a separation agreement clearly it makes sense to have the most tax efficient method possible for both parties succession act writes then the succession act 1965 that makes provision for spouses on the death of uh, the other spouse 
you're going to give up your Succession Act rights as per the Succession Act 1965 and you'll be signing off on that in the separation agreement. There will also be an indemnity in relation to future debts. In other words, each party will indemnify the other party in respect of future debts that might be incurred after the separation. It's worth noting that a separation agreement is a contract, a private contract between the parties. It is enforceable as a contract. Divorce can be obtained after entering a separation agreement. However, if judicial separation is your ultimate goal, it cannot be obtained after a separation agreement because you can't have both a separation agreement and a judicial separation. So the normal course, the normal procedure would be separation agreement and eventually a divorce. When it comes to divorce, then courts must have regard to the contents of the separation agreement. Courts must also, however, ensure proper provision between the parties when granting a divorce. The Supreme Court decision in GVG is very significant in this case, or in this whole area. There's clearly a conflict between, on the one hand, what might be in a separation agreement, as agreed between the parties, and on the other hand, a judge's obligation to make proper provision between the parties when granting a divorce. The Supreme Court case then, a deed of separation should be given significant weight when it comes to making provision for the parties at a later divorce hearing, especially when the deed of separation contains a full and final settlement clause. That's important. Supreme Court says a deed of separation should be given significant weight. Exceptional circumstances would be needed for a court to upset the separation agreement freely entered into, for example, substantial change such as illness of one of the parties. This GVG case essentially is a second bite of the cherry case. It's an important one from a family law perspective. Essentially, parties would be entitled in the normal course to a second bite of the cherry because there's no full and final uh, clean break situation in Irish law. However, uh, and that's after a separation agreement. However, this case is authority for the proposition that significant weight should be given to the separation agreement between the parties and exceptional circumstances would be required if the separation agreement was going to be set to one side and different terms imposed in terms of a redistribution of wealth or property between the parties. A clean break, the court has recognised, is a legitimate aspiration in Irish law but it's not a guaranteed right, and proper provision may see a change in circumstances being reflected in the final divorce ruling provisions, but it would be in exceptional circumstances. Inherited assets, according to the GVG case, should not be seen as assets obtained by both parties in the marriage. That's inherited assets after the separation. Second bite of the cherry cases uh, have become more difficult. In other words, this GVG case certainly has given a greater emphasis and a greater importance on a separation agreement entered in bet into between the parties. Prior to that, all bets were off insofar as proper provisions still had to be made and if somebody came along then at a divorce situation and went to have a second bite of the cherry, then there was nothing actually stopping them from doing so. Hope you find this video useful. If you do, give it a thumbs up down below and you may be interested in subscribing to my YouTube channel. If you are, hit the subscribe bell down below or button down below and click on the bell and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Thanks for watching.